But I suggest that if you view Jesus that way, you're not going to be able to make sense out of his humanity very well. First of all, he wouldn't really suffer as a human being because one of the greatest problems of suffering as a human is we don't know when it will stop and we can't stop it. It's hopeless because we can't control it. And he wouldn't suffer in that dimension. Moreover, it would be very difficult for Christ as a child. Imagine, imagine finding out that anything you wanted to do as a child, you could do. And no matter how big the puddle were, you could leap over it. <laughs> you could leap an ocean. I would imagine very early in his life, he would have found out there was a lot he could do that others couldn't. But that's not the Jesus that the scriptures show. So I suggest that we have somewhat of a problem here, but the problem is made logically greater when we assert that God is the only uncreated being. And the reason for that is that we can't really share a nature with Christ, beginning with this assumption. So Christology is not possible. Now, when our friends in the Christian, Jewish, and Islamic traditions, and let's focus on the Christian tradition for a moment, say, you have a different Jesus than I do, I always say, what do you mean? Do you mean that you believe that I believe in a different person was walking around the Palestinian countryside than you do? Oh no, I don't mean that. I mean that the things you believe about Jesus are not true and the things I do are. And I say, well, like what? And they'll say, well, you believe that Jesus is distinct from the Father in heaven. And I often answer and say, yes, and so do you. Because you don't believe he's identical to the Father and you believe that there, he has things about him that are different than the Father. So you believe that he's distinct from the Father and we have at least two different beings. And I've never ever had one of my Christian friends say, oh no, oh no, I really believe they're just one. <laughs> they all believe that there are two. And then I say, but you want to, and the next argument is always, well, you believe in more than one God. And I'll say, well, so do you, Father one, Son two, one two. <laughs> to which they want to say, well, you believe that humans can be God. And I say, so do you. The Son was human. And I know that what you mean by God is different than everything that you mean by human. But I suggest to you that we have a very different way of looking at things only because you have an assumption that if we think it through, you're not going to buy. And I suggest that the ultimate assumption is metaphysical monotheism. That assumption is not accurate. It's contrary to the scriptures. And it's not something that I think you can buy into if you believe in the Trinity or if you believe that Jesus was God. Because if Jesus was God, then it's possible for a human being to be both divine, fully divine, and human, fully human. And so you can't possibly argue that I have a different Jesus because I believe that humans can be divine, which brings me to the next problem, the problem of deification. Now, I know that you've all heard this from your Christian friends. You believe that you can be a god. And I always say, well, in what sense do you mean that? I want to back up for a moment because I believe we murder our own doctrine. In fact, we have an incredible talent as LDS for trivializing our own doctrine. I don't know where we came by this talent, but I suggest it comes naturally. I want to use three analogies to suggest the doctrine of theosis or the doctrine of deification. If you talk to your Christian friends and say, we actually believe in the same doctrine, you believe that we will share everything that God has that we are his heirs, that we are his begotten children, and that we will be fully glorified with everything that he is and has. And it's called the doctrine of glorification. That's what Protestants call it, at least. And they'll say, yeah, so? And I'll say, well, you have a misimpression about what being deified means in Mormon thought. Now, I'm going to parody Mormon thought for a moment because I think that this is what they're thinking of when they reject it, and they ought to reject it. What they're thinking of is, that someday, when I say I'm going to be a god, I'm going to take about 40 of my wives, I'm going to fly off to a corner of the universe that God hasn't quite gotten to yet, and I'm going to organize it. And I'm going to be all alone, self-sufficient, like the saints were when they first got to the Rocky Mountain Basin. That's not what we mean. I'm going to use three analogies to suggest what we do mean. The first is one that I can agree on fully with my Christian friends, and which they have used in their own literature. It's an iron and a fire. Say you have a tire iron, and you stick it in a fire, well, the iron will become hot. Now, it's not the nature of the iron to be hot. It's only hot when it participates in the nature of the fire that has a nature to be hot. So I have a distinct nature, an iron, and it, it has a property of the fire communicated to it, heat. In the same way, they would say that 
Our Father has a nature. It's an immortal nature. And He communicates His life to us, and that's how we have mortal li- immortal life with our Father. So God has communicated to us a property that only divinity has, and that is immortal life. And so that's what they mean by deification. God communicates something of his own divine nature to us, and in that sense, we share divine nature. I suggest that we mean at least that when we talk about deification. I'm now going to use another analogy, but I believe they would have to reject it. It's, when we talk about deification, we often think of it in terms of, of son becoming like his father. I have, I have a, a grandchild. He doesn't speak very well. He can't think very clearly. He has a lot of fun playing most of the time. And he's not very much like me at all. But he has the capacity to grow into everything that his grandfather is. But nobody could ever guess just looking at him that he has these capacities. Now this is a fairly decent analogy for what we mean by deification, but it certainly doesn't go far enough. And why not? Well, deification is not simply a matter of just hanging around long enough to grow into what our father is. We don't simply become God because we're good and we live a long time. So I want to correct a misimpression that I think is very common. I want to use another analogy. It's very clear reading our own scriptures and the lectures on faith. The deification only arises when we enter into a certain type of relationship. It's a relationship of indwelling love. That is, it's a relationship that the very type that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost have with one another. And they have invited us into this relationship. John 17, where Christ talks about the disciples becoming one in each other, as the Father and the Son are one in each other, became the basis for the belief in deification in the earliest Latter-day Saint scriptures and in the lectures on faith. I invite you to read what they have to say about John 17. But it's very clear that deification is not something that we do all along. It's not something that we simply become because we live long enough. Deification is what happens to us when we enter into a loving relationship. It is something that is a relationship in and of itself, and we are only divine to the extent that we share our lives fully in one another. So I'd like to suggest another analogy. If I have one atom of deuterium, or form of hydrogen, all in and itself, I have a single thing. But all by itself, it can't become what will happen if I take another atom of deuterium and I fuse them together. If I heat them up, they fuse. If you want to know what happens, go look at what happens when a hydrogen bomb explodes, because that's what's happening. That kind of power arises from fusion. Alone, they don't have this power. Together, there is an incredible light and power that is generated, and that's what it is to be divine in human thought, in, in Mormon thought. We are divine because we are made one. Now I'm going to let you in on a secret. Everything that Joseph Smith did in his entire lifetime was aimed at teaching us how to have this type of relationship. Zion, the order of Zion, the order of Enoch that he developed, was aimed at teaching us how to have the unity that is required for this type of life. It is teaching us how to be one in all things because Joseph Smith wanted to teach us how to have that very same kind of relationship here and now that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost have. That is why the very center of the gospel is the very simple admonition, love one another. And that is why all the law and the prophets hinge on this one commandment. Because it all comes down to this, what our Father has to give us, what he has to teach us, all arises from entering into loving relationships. But not merely being in love in the way that we wish each other well. I wish all of you well, but I don't have an intimate and abiding fellowship with all of you. To enter into an intimate and abiding fellowship requires work, (laughs) and a lot of it. And it requires the kind of trust and intimacy. I'm going to suggest that one of the reasons that the family relationship is a focus is that this is probably the best school in the world for learning these types of relationships. And I'm going to tell you about a paradox of a sort. 